Matt, thanks so much for coming in to talk about your new book that you've just published with Crossway, Asking the Right Questions, A Practical Guide to Understanding and Applying the Bible. We're very excited to have published this and glad to have you in the Crossway studio. Thanks. It's great to be here. So tell us just a little bit about yourself, who you are, and where you're from, and where you teach, and yeah. where you studied. Yeah, so I'm a New Testament professor at Grace College and Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, so not too far from the Chicago area here. And I've been there for almost 11 years. And my wife Kate and I have two boys. Uh, John is 19, Jake is 16. They both love basketball, and so I actually help coach them at various points, and that's something that uh, keeps me busy outside of teaching and writing and those kinds of things. And tell us why you wrote this book. You've written a, a major commentary on Philippians. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of different projects, but why did you want to write a book on understanding and applying the Bible? As I uh, serve in the church and uh, interact with both college students and people in Sunday school classes and that kind of thing, one of the things that I found consistently was a desire to read the Bible, but oftentimes a confusion or just a, a lack of training to know how to do it well. And so there was this sort of uh, undercurrent of frustration of, I want to do this, I know I should do this, but when I open the Bible, I just really don't even know what I'm supposed to be looking for, what things I'm supposed to be focusing on or not focusing on. And so over time, I began to develop just a series of questions of what should we be looking for when reading any passage of Scripture? And from that, it basically turned into a, a handout that I used in small groups and in Sunday school classes and even in my classes at Grace. And people seemed to really uh, latch on to that and began to use it and pass it on in other contexts. And so I began to think, could I turn this into something that would have a little bit wider distribution? in terms of some basic questions to help anyone, not just the academically oriented or the people who might be inclined to um, you know, take a class or something like that, but I wanted to have something that I could put into the hands of any believer, even if they're not a reader, so that they could understand some basic questions to ask of any passage and therefore be able to kind of grow in their walk with God. What sort of effect have you seen that have on students or people in your church? It's been fun to see uh, different people in the church uh, come back to me and start telling me about things that they're seeing most, especially about God. And uh, there's uh, even the own experience, my, the experience of my, my wife. She, in a recent preaching series that we've been doing, she's been focusing on journaling what she's learning about God as we're working through different books of the Bible in a preaching series at church. And recently she compiled in her journal a list of 200 different things that she had learned about God over the course of this particular uh, preaching series and kind of using these questions in the book as a template for uh, thinking about what is God showing her about himself. If you were to get a text from your wife and it were to say something like, uh, Matt, after school today, could you pick up some milk and eggs? That's a command. Mm -hmm. It's a very clear command. You know the, yeah. the definition of those terms and you know exactly what you're supposed to do. But scripture gets more complicated because sure. even when it's a direct command, it's mm -hmm. not a direct command to you. It right. may be a command from the Lord through Moses to the Israelites. Yeah. And we get confused, like, how does that apply to us today? So maybe talk a little bit about the complexity of applying the Bible and understanding the Bible first. And how do we start to think through something like that? Yeah, there's a lot that goes on in terms of trying to understand the Bible correctly. It's written in a different time period. It, it deals often with customs and people that we're not familiar with. And there are those kinds of barriers. And sometimes it uses words or just ideas that aren't very common in our culture today. So you add all of that on top of how do I then try to apply it to my life? And it does get complicated pretty quickly. So I think that one of the blessings that we have living today is the fact that we have so many resources available to us to help us with that. Even within the last 20 years, I think there's been an explosion of helpful resources. Now, the downside of that is that that can drown someone in just, well, well what do I do? There's so many things I could be using, so many resources that are out there. So again, that's part of the reasons I wanted to give something simple as a starting point that then people could branch off from there. But when it comes to applying a text such as a command that 
God gives through Moses to the Israelites, I think that one of the key things to understand is where are we at in the biblical storyline? Mm -hmm. Understanding that we're not Israelites today. We're not traveling with Moses wandering in the wilderness on our way to the promised land. We are 21st century New Covenant believers, and so a lot has happened since that. So anytime we look at a command that Moses gives to the uh, Israelites, we have to ask ourselves, does, does the New Testament pick this command up in any fashion and explain it or give it in another form? And if not, then I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what's the principle behind it? What, is, what does this show us about who God is and what he values, what's important to him? What does it show us about how we are to live with each other and from there begin to principalize or ac extract from that um, what God would have us learn from and apply from that particular passage today. One of the things you talk about in the book is uh, our fallen condition. How mm -hmm. does that uh, concept and reality affect how we approach biblical passages? Well, the fallen condition, really I've just borrowed that from Brian Chappell in his helpful book, uh, Christ Center Preaching. And really, it's just a way of thinking about what sort of sinful attitudes, actions, habits, inclinations, tendencies are revealed in the passage that I share in today. And so it's based on the premise that although people in, the, in biblical times might have faced some different challenges and lived in a different culture, fundamentally they're still fallen human beings. And they still had uh, sinful desires and tendencies that we share today, even if they express themselves differently. So when you begin to use that as a, as a lens to look at the Bible, what it can do is it helps you bridge that gap between how do I connect with someone living in first century Philippi or um, a Jewish man watching Jesus teach in first century Judea. So it helps us to make that connection of, yeah, his life might look a little bit different than mine, but he still struggles with the same forms of sinful temptations or idolatries that I struggle, even if their expression takes different form. And that's one of those connection points that I think if people understand, it really can open up their Bible reading so they can get something from just about any passage that they open, even if they're very far away removed in terms of the culture and the time and the experience of that particular person or that particular passage. Think about the, the ways in which people read their Bibles and um one common way might be for somebody just to kind of randomly open up their Bible. Yeah. I feel like I should be reading the Bible this morning. I'm going to open up. Okay, here's Gospel John. I'm going to read a little bit. Sure. Um, or maybe a more sophisticated approach. I've got a plan I'm going to work through, and mm -hmm. this morning I'm going to read this one paragraph from the Gospel of John. Sure. Um, and I think we'd both agree we'd rather have people doing that than not opening their right. Bible at all. But what are sure. some of the drawbacks of those kind of maybe common approaches to sure. picking up the Word? Well, the, uh, the first approach you mentioned, I think, can have the danger of you end up gravitating back towards the same group of familiar places. Mm -hmm. And so you might begin to be familiar with those over time, but there are large chunks of the Bible that you just end up neglecting that uh, have very important things to teach us about who God is and how we should f live as his people and those kinds of things. So that's probably the main danger of that kind of, well, I'll just kind of randomly pick this. The danger on the plan side of things is that it can become so routine that it becomes just one more thing that's a checklist that you check off of your list. Okay, I, I, I got my time in. And you haven't stopped to ask yourself, what is God really teaching me in this passage? What is God showing me about himself, about me, about the world around me, and how should I respond to that? So it can become very formalized and very uh, dry quickly if you're not careful to sort of counteract that. One thing that I appreciate about you knowing you personally and uh, overlapping in the same church for a while is that you really do care about the local church. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, I don't want to be unfair to other authors, but a lot of people writing on this topic of how to read the Bible can give the impression that it's just about you and the Lord, mm -hmm. which is important that we have sure. time alone with the Lord each day. Right. Uh, but how does your book intersect with the idea of not just me and the Lord, mm -hmm. but uh, me and the Lord in the context of community sure. and the communion of saints? What's the role of community in uh, Bible reading, applying the Bible, understanding the Bible? 
I think the role of community is essential because uh, it helps put in, in place some necessary checks on mm. us because we can tend to gravitate towards a very subjective either reading or applying of the Bible. And when we're in community with other people, those other believers can kind of enter in and say, actually, I think there's more to that passage than that, or actually, I don't think that passage is really saying that, or I think you've misunderstood that. And so I think that one of the benefits of reading the Bible in a, in a small group, in a Sunday school class, in those sort of smaller contexts, is that it allows also for the intersection of what we're reading in the Bible with how it applies to our lives. And other people can enter in and say things that we might need to hear, but may not be noticing in and of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And even as someone who has been a, a believer now for close to 30 years of my life, I sit there and I will teach undergraduate students, new believers, and we'll work through passages and they'll make observations that I've not really noticed before or I'll think, Maybe I've seen that before, but it just hasn't really hit me as to why that's significant. Or maybe it's because I'm experiencing something in my own life right now, and they bring that point out, and I think, I just really needed to hear that. That I wouldn't have necessarily gotten that just sitting alone by myself with my Bible open. So God uses community to help us understand the Bible better, apply it more faithfully to our lives. And it also, to be honest, provides another level of accountability. Hmm. It's another level of not just are you in the Word, but you know, as you begin to discuss, God's convicting me about this particular area. Okay, so let me follow up with that next week. You mentioned last week that you had felt really convicted about pride or about being uh, jealous of someone. How's that going? And so it provides an opportunity for us to enter in to each other's lives in a more uh, significant way as we read the Bible in community. So just two more questions sure. for you. Yeah. What can we learn from Jesus about how to read the Bible? Because I think we all intuitively know if we're followers of Christ, yeah. we want to think like Christ thought sure. and follow his ways and he read the word. Mm -hmm. And so how did he read the Bible and, and what can we learn from how he read the Bible? Yeah, I think that's one of the most neglected questions when it comes to reading the Bible because we often miss that Jesus did have things to say about how we should read the scriptures. In fact, in John 5, he uh, criticizes the religious leaders for being experts in the scripture and missing the main point that was standing right before them in himself. But when you look at uh, Luke 24, I think that's one of the classic passages where we see it most clearly, that in the aftermath of his resurrection, Luke goes out of his way to record two separate conversations about this very topic, about how we're supposed to understand the Bible. So first it's on the road to Emmaus with the smaller group of disciples, and he's explaining to them how all of Scripture points to the Christ in some fashion. And so you think, oh, Luke really wants to make that a clear point. He mentions it once. And then later in the chapter when Jesus appears again to the fuller group of disciples, he brings it up again and begins to talk about the fact that all of Scripture points to him in some fashion. And one of the things that I love about that passage is uh, there's a point where Jesus says, as it is written. And then normally when you see that in Scripture, you expect a quotation from the Old Testament, but you don't have that. You have basically a summary of the Old Testament message that the Christ must suffer, that he must die, that he must be raised from the dead, and that the announcement of that good news must go to the ends of the earth, the announcement of the gospel, the call for repentance and faith. All of that, Jesus says, this is what the Old Testament message is, and I'm the fulfillment of that. And so I would say that if we read the Old Testament in a way that's divorced from that, we're not reading the Bible the way Jesus wants us to read it. So in some fashion, every passage somehow points forward to the need for Christ, who Christ is, what he's going to accomplish. Uh, it gives us pictures of the kind of person he's going to be by even drawing contrasts with you know, kings and prophets and priests that when you see an idealized king like David, you see that, well, Anything good David does is actually a shadow of the greater king, Jesus, who's coming later. Or anything that David does wrong as a king. Well, the son of David who's greater than him 
is going to be perfect and therefore not fall into those same patterns of behavior and sin. So just having some of those categories available to us can help us read the Bible in, uh, in a way that helps us connect it to the gospel message, even if you're in Ecclesiastes, Leviticus, or Song of Solomon, or Isaiah, or no matter where you're at, or even getting into the epistles, making sure we're tying those things back to who Christ is and what he's done for us as we look at some of the different commands that Paul gives us in, the, in his letters, or Peter, when they give specific commands of, you know, be angry and do not sin. Okay, well, let's think more holistically about how that connects to the gospel message and who Christ is and what he's done for us. So for the final question, what would you say if somebody picked up asking the right questions? What are they going to learn? What benefits are they going to have? Or maybe to ask it a different way, what is your prayer and your hope for people who end up picking up a copy of this book and reading it? Well, my ultimate hope in anyone picking up this book is that they are going to, as a result, know God better and be equipped with a set of tools that will help them see God more clearly, see Christ more clearly, clearly in Scripture, and as a result of seeing His beauty and His glory and His perfections, to be changed to reflect Christ more clearly. There's really nothing magical about these questions. These are questions that are really just trying to get a person on the right path to being able to experience Christ as they read the Bible so that they're growing closer to Him, they're seeing their life transformed to reflect more and more who Christ is and, and how, he, how he would want us to live. And so I'm trying to give you a set of tools that would be useful in getting you to that, to that place. And so that's what I pray happens as a result of uh, people reading this book is that they'll be equipped to see Christ more clearly in Scripture, to follow him more closely, and as a result, that the good news of the gospel ends up going further to the ends of the earth as a result of people following Christ.